Hello, and welcome to Generational Ministries. I'm your host and storyteller, Sandra Fitzgerald. Today's story is entitled, The Brotherhood of the Saints. So let's get started. Am I my brother's keeper? This is a question that has been passed down through the centuries. Since the first two brothers, Cain and Abel, were born, in this lesson we will be examining the lives and relationship between the brothers. Brothers like Cain and Abel that had a blood bond and brothers like Jonathan and David who were bound in spirit. You know how they say it, that's my brother from another mother. So we'll be examining blood brothers and chosen brothers. It's interesting to note that many times brothers not related by blood share a stronger bond. In this lesson, we will see all kinds of emotions that men experience in relationship with each other, ranging from the resentful feelings of the first brother Cain to the big brother and father figure of Jesus to his disciples. We will begin in Genesis 4 with the story of Cain and his younger brother Abel. The story is a relatively short one, beginning with Cain's birth and ending with Abel's death, which, by the way, was by the hand of Cain. Why would Cain do such a thing? We believe it is safe to reason that Cain had harbored feelings of resentment against Abel for a long time, maybe since his birth. Let's do a life application here. A son is born. He's the apple of his parents' eye. Their whole life centers around their golden boy. After all, he's their first son. He can do no wrong. When he playfully yells, look at me, look at me, they stop what they're doing and lovingly respond with high praise. Their little boy's world is a wonderful place to be. In time, all this changes when mom delivers another son. Now she has little time for Golden Boy. In fact, his parents seem to have forgotten that he even exists. This new child seems to get all of the attention, time, and love once his brother came. What's more, mom and dad are so overprotective of this one that the older child finds himself spending much of his time watching over and babysitting the young brother. So they want everybody to look on baby brother as an angel. He is angry at this intrusion of his life. He never asked for a sibling. His anger grows to resentment and resentment leads to bitterness. Could this have been what happened to Cain? Could he have had to watch Abel through hurting and resentful eyes, thinking Adam and Eve looked on Abel with more favor than they showed him. In Genesis chapter 4 and 8, Cain seemed to just boil over with rage, and in that rage, he murders Abel. In a closer look at this verse, we will notice Cain and Abel having a conversation. Wonder if Abel was tongue Cain. Maybe unwittingly setting the trap for himself by proudly commenting on how God was so pleased with his offering. Perhaps he didn't even realize that Cain had begun to see him as an enemy years ago and that Cain was tired of watching over him all these years and tired of him going on and on about his precious sheep. The Bible indicates that Cain was sick of watching over Abel, period. Listen to this somewhat sarcastic answer when God asked him where was his brother Abel. This is what Cain said. Am I my brother's keeper? Cain seemed to be displaying his resentment for being put in a role of big brother and caretaker. After all, again, he never asked for a brother. The story of Cain and Abel is a sad account of a relationship gone bad between brothers. In this lesson, 
we will examine other relationships between blood brothers or natural siblings that took a terrible turn in time. We'll see brothers stealing from one another, lying to one another, death threats, and sadly the actual death of one brother in our story of Cain and Abel. We will also look at the relationships between brothers and spirit. And at the end of our lesson, we will note the difference between these two types of relationship. Again, natural brothers and chosen brothers. As always, we will attempt to find us in the lesson and hopefully learn something about our relationships and make any necessary changes and adjustment for more successful fellowship among each other. We will travel forward to chapter 27 of Genesis. Here we find two more brothers by the name of Esau and Jacob. These guys were twins. Their struggle began even before they were born. Literally. Genesis 25, 22 verifies this fact. In verse 23, God gives an account of the twins' future stating that the younger would rule over the elder. Was God showing favoritism to Jacob? Maybe so, but isn't it his right to do so? Does God tell Moses in a read by Saul in Romans 9 and 15, God said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So that means God says he can do what he want to do because we belong to him, not the other way around. God is our keeper in our state. We don't keep God, he keeps us. And he can do what and when he wants to do with any and any everybody that he choose. It's God's business. Now having said that, let's return to our story. As the boys grew, we're talking about Esau and Jacob now. Esau was favored by his father Isaac because Esau was a hunter. And Rebekah, their mother, loved Jacob. Could this have been the cause of dissension between the brothers? Remember, this is the story of Jacob stealing his brother Esau's birthright. But did Jacob really steal it? Or did Esau give it up in a careless moment of self-gratification? The story also gives an account of Rebekah masterminding the whole setup. Jacob receives the blessing of his father and Esau receives nothing. So why did she do that to Esau? And Esau was her son too. Both of them was her babies. Let's unravel the first question. Did Jacob steal Esau's birthright? The answer is no. Esau sold Jacob his birthright for a bowl of beans. Read it for yourself in Genesis 25, 31 through 34. And what, are this, what does this say about Esau's character? Well, with the birthright in his possession, Jacob now only has to receive the blessing, then he got it all, clean, sweet. Now Esau is mad. He's left with very little, and he's had time now to think about and absorb the full impact of his actions by selling his birthright. He's seeing Jacob in a whole new light. Now he's giving some side out here. He by now resents Jacob for taking advantage of his hunger all those years ago. Unknown to him, Rebecca is in cahoots with Jacob to trick her husband Isaac into giving the blessing of the elder son to the youngest son. Why would she do such a thing? Could it be she was ensuring God's prophecy to her would come true? After all, God did tell her that the younger would rule over the older. However, we never saw God asking for her help in bringing this prophecy to pass. The Bible shows the same thing happened with her mother-in-law Sarah in the account of Isaac and Ishmael. Let's just talk about them next. Okay, 
But right now, we'll finish up with Jacob and Esau. By now, Isaac has grown old, and in tradition of the Israelites, it was the father's time to bless the eldest son. As stated before, Rebecca had tricked Jacob into blessing the youngest son. So that left Esau with nothing. Add to that, the blessing made Esau servant to Jacob. Now this was also not just talking about those two brothers. They were talking about the whole line of Esau's kin and the whole line of Jacob's kin. All of their the inheritors would be the old would bow down to the young. This was, as they say, the straw that broke the back for Esau. It was too much. And Esau swore in Genesis 27 and 41 to kill Jacob. He, he just couldn't take no more. Now talk about a sibling rivalry. Now at this point in time, there is no love between those two brothers. However, time has a way of healing all wounds. And in Genesis 33 and 4, we find them reunited. Look at God. All right. Now let's go back for a moment and touch on the relationship between Isaac and his brother Ishmael. This is the story of Abraham and his two sons. The father had been promised by God that he would be the patriarch of many nations. Now that's Abraham we're talking about. Many years went by, and Abraham and his wife Sarah had no child. Fearing that the promise would not be kept in time, Sarah hatches a plan to have her maid, which was named Hagar, to go into her husband and have sex with him so that they might have a child through her maid, and call it theirs. This wasn't something unusual that happened in those days, but I think that God would agree with me that it is unwise to do so, to turn your husband over to another woman. I don't think that's a good thing. Well, all of it worked out as planned, and Ishmael was born. Now, Ishmael was not the child of promise, so after he was born, and even before then, Hagar began to disrespect Sarah because she had birthed Abraham's son. I can just see a rub in her stomach showing off because she done got herself a baby by the patriarch. But now this is where the trouble starts between the two sons, Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac was born about 13 years later through Abraham and Sarah. He makes it clear that that's his promised son. In fact, the Bible calls Isaac his only son, even though we know that Abraham had many more sons. As stated earlier, the trouble arose between the mothers of the two boys, and it resulted in going downward from the parents into the children. You know, when mama can get something started, it's going to leak into the child. The scripture does not give an account of a relationship between the two boys. However, if we inserted a life application here, how would any 13-year-old boy feel about being put out of his father's life because his father got a new son? Many times today, if a man has children by different mothers, they don't get along for whatever reason. The strife keeps the children from having meaningful relationships. The scripture does go on to say that Ishmael becomes a man of violence. Because I can imagine he had a lot of anger inside of him from being tossed aside after his brother was born, Isaac. Perhaps this was his way of getting his anger out at being separated from Abraham, his father. The scripture doesn't say this, but we'll just use it as food for thought. Another interesting fact that we'll note in Genesis 25, verse 1 and 2, Isaac and Ishmael 
like I said before, have other brothers. Abraham married a woman named Keturah, and they had six sons. In verse 5 of the same chapter, Abraham gives all that he had to Isaac. Now, can you imagine the court petitions would to change your will that that happened today? Somebody might even get killed. If one kid get everything and you got six more sons, then get nothing? I don't think that would go over too well. Anyway, time passed. And although we don't see a lot of interaction between Jacob, between Isaac and Ishmael, they were seen in the book of Genesis 25:19. They were seen together burying their father at the end of his life. So look at God. You might not always get along with brothers and family, but as my mother used to say, teeth and tongue fall out but family is forever. Okay, so now let's talk about Isaac's grandson. Now Jacob's boys had 12 sons and they were each named for a tribe. They had different mothers, including two wives. Leah, he, she had six sons. Her maid Zilpah had two sons. Rachel had two sons. Her maid Bilhah had two sons. So it was a lot of son having going on. Now with all these sons, Jacob turns right around and did the same thing that father did to him. Loved Joseph more than any other rest of his sons. Now say what you will. When you show favoritism for one child over another, it causes mistrust and resentment among the children. It's not surprising that hatred and jealousy sprang up into the hearts of these brothers. They couldn't stand the sight of him. So Joseph ended up being sold into slavery by his brothers because they simply could not stand the fact that their father loved Joseph more than he loved any of them. And after many years of separation, we still find these brothers reunited. So go into your Bibles and read Genesis 45 and read the whole story because that's good reading right there. So, so far our story here has been about strife between blood brothers, brothers that were born from the same father, okay? Favoritism is one form favoritism in one form or another causes bitterness, envy, and ultimately separation for all of these brothers. We have to reason that as parents we should strive to cultivate special relationships with all of our children if we have more than one. We can't help but one, if these things would have been different between these biblical brothers if some was not made to feel less than others. Even Aaron spoke against Moses out of jealousy. Now listen to him in Numbers 12 and 1. Hath the Lord spoken only to Moses? Hath he not also spoken by us? Now obviously this is a condition of human nature. We don't get to choose our families. So we have to work with what we have. We wonder if it's even possible to override the inclination to have favorites. After all, we were created in God's images, image and he made no bones that he favored humans. Look in the Bible. You will find it. He made us just a little lower than angels. Romans 9.15 attests to this. Which he says again, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. A couple of verses below it was written, Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated. We can be sure that theologists and Bible scholars that could probably go deeper with those statements and try to explain God's position in a relationship to all these blood brothers. 
However, it is not our purpose for this lesson. After all, God's thoughts are not our thoughts, and neither are his ways our ways. Like I said before, we belong to God. He can do what he wants to do. If you own something, you know, we quick to say, that's mine. I can do what I want to do with it. So that's the way God feels. He don't have to ask us to bless somebody or to do something or to work a miracle or to bring about something. He just speak it and it is so. Don't believe me? Check out the first book in the Bible. God said, I am that I am. So what is I am? Anything that I won't be. So we're going to take that and keep it as food for thought. Okay, now let's move forward and examine the relationship between brothers that choose each other. Brothers in spirit. These are what we call camaraderie relationships. We can reason many of these types of brother relationships and they work well together. One gets to choose. That's a friend. You don't, a friend can be a sister to you. But that's the fact. You chose her. Some our sisters by our parents, we don't get to choose them. Now, if one person gets to choose a relationship, you can also choose to end one. For instance, if we have a friend that is a show-off, we can cut them off. But if our sibling is a show-off and underage, we got to live with it and deal with the feelings that comes with it, many times making for strained and bitter rivalries between siblings. After all, where can you go when you're a child? And by the time you reach manhood, the damage has been done. Jealousy and envy is a big problem among a lot of siblings. And so we want to be careful to how we treat our children how and careful not to show overly favoritism because it causes resentment throughout the lives of those children. And once they grow up and have children, who say they won't do the same thing? It's happened before with Jacob and his children. It happened before him with his two twins. So that's something that we have to look out for. We don't want to be showing too much favoritism. You know, it's just natural to favor some people over others because maybe they look like you or there's something that about them that reminds you of something. But we want to try to keep that in check because it causes resentment. Okay? Now, let's check out Joshua and Caleb. They were bound by the fact that they were the only two original men that came from Egypt at the time of the great exodus. Jonathan was also another son. He was the son of Saul, and Saul was the first king of Israel. He was bound to David, and so much that he risked his own life to save his friend David from Saul's wrath. Jonathan loved David, and they were not blood brothers. They they chose to be brothers. They had a spirit bond that lasted the rest of their lives until Jonathan died. Also in the book of 1 Samuel, we find Eli and Samuel so close that when the Lord called Eli, Samuel heard it. Now that's up close and personal. Now travel forward in time to the New Testament, we find Jesus with his disciples, or his boys, his homie, his posse. By now, you can see that Jesus had a special relationship with these men. Only two were his blood brothers. The others were brothers he chose. Their relationship takes many twists and turns, as recorded from the book of Matthew and John. They were squabbles over who was the greatest. They got mad over position and two of them ain't want to sit on the right hand of God. There was one betrayal, one denial, 
Yet with all of this, they stay together. And even after Jesus' death and resurrection, they continue to labor in the gospel. This is a very special close bond between these disciples. Yes, they chose to be brothers. So be encouraged to read about Jesus and his caretaker, father figure, and big brother role with these boys. In the book of Acts, it tells of the conversion of Paul, who goes from worldly to having spiritual bonds with other people in Christ, such as Barnabas, John, Mark, Silas, Timothy, and Titus. They all work together as brothers to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. There was a camaraderie. They loved each other. Now, not saying that they never had strife, because you know that whether you love somebody or not, sometimes you're going to have a little strife. And what we said the important thing was to get rid of it quickly before it can fester into your heart. So in conclusion, even though history has shown us terrible twins and relationships can make blood brothers take the lives of another brother, that's something we don't want to do. Even think about this. In the Civil War, you had brother against brother, cousin against cousin, uncle against nephew, because you simply lived in two parts of the country. If you lived in the South, you were a Confederate. If you lived in the North, you were of the Union Army. And sometimes it clashed. Like, for instance, I have two sisters that live upstate. I live in Virginia. Had we been involved in the Civil War, we would have been against each other. So that's something to think about. So as we go further and go forward, we just want to remember that whether we are brothers or sisters in spirit, behold how good and pleasant it is to dwell together in unity. It's nothing better and more pleasing to God than when we try to get along with our brothers and our sisters. He don't like strife. He don't like when we turn at each other and bickering and fighting. He wants us to strive to get along because family is everything. Family is your insurance against old age, sickness, especially good, tight family. Like I said, teeth and tongue fall out. You don't have to agree with everything somebody say to love them. You still keep that love open and keep that heart clean. So again, thank you for listening. And I hope that we get together again soon with another lesson. And that one is called Sister, Sister. Thank you again.